Well, if recital planning has got you frazzled, <laughs> you're in the right place because today we're diving into the magical world of recitals with five tips for planning a perfect recital anytime, anytime, where music not only touches the ears, but also the hearts. Yes, the hearts and souls. If, you, if you've ever felt like planning a recital is just this daunting task, Today's show is going to be your guiding light. So welcome to the Ultimate Music Teachers live show. I'm your host, Glory St. Germain, joined by the ever-inspiring co-host, Joanne Barker. Joanne, planning recitals can be overwhelming and sometimes even a little bit frustrating when you don't know where to begin, right? Absolutely. You know, I've read several posts in this last week from particularly new teachers saying, I, it's my first time doing this. What do I do? Where do I start? How do I do this? You know, we all grew up going to recitals, but we did just that, didn't we? We went to recitals. So today we're going to reveal five tips for planning the perfect recital anytime, transforming your recitals from routine to remarkable. So tune in, take notes, and get ready to revolutionize your recital planning. So what's tip number one, Glory? All right. Yes, you're right, Joanne. Take some notes. I think this is going to be awesome. Tip number one, our first tip is about setting the stage literally. So tip number one is about creating a themed recital that adds an element of excitement and engagement. So for example, imagine a Baroque bash or a jazz jamboree where students dress up in era specific costumes, bringing history and style to life. It's not just a recital, but it's kind of a time travel experience. So imagine how much fun that would be for your students. That would be really great, Glory. And, you know, remember, the theme can be about anything that sparks creativity. How about like a movie music night or, you know, students can play famous music uh, from, from film scores or a musical mashup blending classical with pop, like take the Paco Bell Cannon and let's make it into jazz. Oh, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Oh, I hear it coming now. I have to go do it. The key is to make it fun and inclusive, yet keeping it not so overcomplicated that you're spending your life planning it. So this is the time of year to start really thinking about it. We want to ignite that passion for performance in our students. It's not just about producing concert pianists in the future, but these students are going to have to oh, apply for a mortgage or go for a job interview or give a presentation at school. So we're helping them. These are good life skills to help our students with. And recitals, what I really like about playing piano is you look at the piano. You don't have to stand there and look at the audience, do you? <laughs> This is true, Joanne. <laughs> this is true. But I think one of the things that you just said, you know, was was just about building confidence in our students and helping them deliver, you know, and develop life skills. Right. Mm -hmm. And it kind of segues into tip number two. And that's when you want to double the fun with duets. So have you ever played a duet with your student or with a friend? Well, a duet recital opens up the doors to collaboration and students can pair up together with other students in your teaching studio, or maybe they have a friend who's also, you know, taking music lessons somewhere else and they want to do a duet. That'd be okay. Um, or you could um, do a teacher student duet. I've played a lot of duets with my students. I know you have as well, Joanne. And it's a great way to build rapport and showcase teamwork because it's not always just about being solo. Sometimes we just want to have fun. And what I love most about playing duets, Joanne, is I always think I get to blame the other person if there's a mistake in the performance. I'm just like, wasn't me, wasn't me. You know, I really love that idea, Glory. And, and you know, I'm sure a lot of you out there could relate to this. Have you ever had that student who comes, you know, like 10 days before the recital and they're not ready to perform? Yeah. That's quite often when I'll pop in and say, well, why don't we do it as a duet? Yeah. We don't want to you know, cut that kid down and say, well, you should have practiced. Yes. They know that. They And maybe they just had a busy life. Maybe something happened in their world that they couldn't get that practice in. So then you can make it into this special little thing that, well, this student and I are going to do something special. We're, we, we're going to do a duet for you today. So you, you can kind of give some grace to that student to give them the experience of performing and just kind of like lift them up a bit and encourage them, right? It's imagine like the, the child parent duet, that's fabulous. How many of our parents of students have taken piano lessons before and to get them back up and have to experience that nervousness their child is. It's not about just about the music. It's about creating lasting memories and strengthening bonds. And plus it's a really great way for students to learn from each other. 
Yeah, absolutely, Joanne. And I love, you know, I said I love playing duets. I love playing duets with my students. And I remember playing duets with my my own children, right? My daughter, Sherry, my son, David. And I think it just is, it's really making memories. Just mm -hmm. what you said. I love it. So tip number three. This is a good one. Tip number three, for those of you taking notes, is the your own composition recital. So tip number three is for the composers at heart, hosting a recital where students perform their own compositions or even play each other's composition. And it offers a really unique platform for creativity and expression. And for those of you teachers who think, well, ew, I'm not really, I don't feel comfortable teaching composing, check out the Ultimate Music Theory Supplemental Workbook Series, because we introduce composition in the Ultimate Music Theory Supplemental Workbooks, and you will just have a wealth of knowledge for you as a teacher but also providing your students with the tools to actually explore composition and creativity. So yeah, have your own uh, composition and perform it or maybe play each other's. That sounds like a good idea, doesn't it, Joanne? I think so. And you know, this tip isn't just for advanced students. You know, right. as you might've heard me say last week, I've been off work due to a perforated eardrum and I'm going to be hosting, having some composition classes when I get back to, to work using some of the ideas from the business booster, that's going to help me make up for the lessons I've missed. I charge an annual tuition, so they're still paying me while I'm off, but I need to make up those lessons. So composition classes and the thing that composing does for students, when they make it, they will play it. The, the practicing just goes right off the charts and it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, four bars, four bars, I, I'm an ABA kind of person. I like my A section, a nice B section and go back to the A section. It doesn't have to be complicated. The right. fact that they can put their ideas down and you know that you need structure. So as you said, in the supplemental series, it's laid out how to structure those phrases to make it make sense. And you don't have to have fancy software. I happen to have Finale, so everybody gets a polished copy, but having them write it out that's yes. an excellent exercise to get it. It's about expressing their, their own musical voice. I've had some interesting compositions one that comes to mind right away is uh, this little boy wrote one in a minor called deadly skulls <laughs> but he loved it and he played it and some of them have come up with these really complicated ideas that like in, intense complicated rhythms and they had to figure out the rhythms so there's so much benefit to doing a composition recital and the other thing is if they make a mistake Nobody knows because it's an original <laughs> composition. So it's really a, a great way to, to foster that deep sense of accomplishment and pride and to get your students practicing. Absolutely. You know, I've got a big smile on my face, Joanne, because as you were sharing that story, it just reminded me of when uh, one of my students was, um, you know, had done his composition and he was proudly going up to play at the recital and he sat down played the first chord and then you know how your mind just goes blank. So he played the first chord and then he literally just composed like right there on the spot and finished it because he knew how to end with his, you know, five, seven cadence at the end, wrapped it up, took his big bow. Everyone was applauding. You know, like you said, nobody knew. And he looked at me and he went, I don't know, and he walked <laughs> off the stage. So it's true. When you have your own composition, no one can say, I think there's a wrong note there because maybe you wanted it that way, but... It was really a fun recital when all my students... And remember, keep it simple, right? They don't have to be complicated. We're talking like six-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old kids. Yeah. We're not talking full-blown concertos here. A yeah. simple, you know, chord in the left hand, single note in the left hand. They don't have to be complicated. But yeah. the sense of pride and the parents, oh my goodness, the buttons burst right off their shirts. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Well, I think we'll dive into tip number four. This is, this is fun. Tip number four is story time recital. So when you think about this, the story time recital is this. Here's where students share their musical journey or the story behind their piece that they are performing, whether it's their own composition or whether they've chosen to prepare a piece that um, for performance that was written by somebody else. And I remember when I was playing a piece and I did some research about Bach and found out that his brother was leaving, uh, Adagissimo is the name of the piece. And 
it was a sad piece. And I sort of shared about how sad I was, you know, when my brother was moving and it was just an interesting little connection. So it's about connecting the music with the personal narratives and adding that depth into each performance. What's the story behind the music? It's not just the music where everyone has to kind of make up their own story in their head, but it's actually more meaningful when you can share a little bit of your personal story with, you know, why you chose this piece, what does it mean to you? And it helps the audience connect with the music too. And to have students, like you just said about, about Bach's brother and all that, that's, you're getting a history lesson in there too, aren't you? Yes. And we, we're not in a world now where you have to have those textbooks on your shelf, like my music history textbook from university to find this information. They can Google Bach. Yeah, they can Google Christopher Norton, you know, they can, you know, just to, to give a two minute or a 30 second little thing about, you know, Christopher Norton was born in New Zealand and lived in London, England, and now he's living in Stratford, Ontario, and he writes this kind of music. Yeah. How wonderful is that for students to get to feel a connection? And you know what else they could do? They could send a letter or an email to those living composers, couldn't they? Yes. Wouldn't yeah. that be cool? That'd be very cool. Yeah. Very you know, cool. I love that idea, Joanne. Get, get to know the composers, right? You know, it's not just about building the skills. It's, it's not just about building the confidence and this public speaking abilities. It's about understanding the music and where it comes from. Yeah. And so we really want to encourage our students to share why they chose the piece. How often do you see students looking through the book and it's like, well, why do you want that? Well, it looks the easiest. Yeah. And it's not always the easiest, is it? So to find out their why... <laughs> why they chose it is, is so powerful and, and to give the, the student a chance to maybe even think about, well, why do I like this piece? Mm -hmm. What is it I like about this? I have one student who uh, really struggled with Jingle Bells this year when you have to play the tonic chord with, with F, the C chord with F. She didn't like the accented dissonance. So that student, her why she chooses a piece would be because the chords all fit together with the melody, right? Mm -hmm. So to ask students their why and have them examine why they want to play something. I think it could turn this recital into a really heartfelt storytelling session. Yeah, absolutely, Joanne. You know, you just reminded me too of, you, you know, you were talking about composers and Christopher Norton and so on. And I remember when Christopher Norton was here in Winnipeg and each one of my students performed a Christopher Norton piece for Christopher Norton. And, you know, he shared a little bit about, you know, why he wrote this piece and things like that. And it was just connecting at a deeper level with the composer himself. And one of the recitals that I did was called Peculiar Pets. Mm. And inside the Ultimate Music Theory Supplemental Workbook series, you will see that there are pieces written in every single level um, by um, one of our composers, Julianne Orkentine, and she wrote about peculiar pets. So what we did was we actually surprised her. We invited uh, Julianne to the recital. She had no idea. And every one of my students was playing a peculiar pet piece composed by Julianne Workentine. And we all brought pets. So there was turtles, there was snakes, there was all kinds of stuffed animals. And they had to do a lot of research just to go find, you know, a penguin and all these other stuffed animals. And so as each student came up and performed, they told a little story about their pet, their stuffy, and they played it on the grand piano and we rehearsed this so at the end of the recital the piano was full of stuffed animals all these peculiar pets and uh it was a great great recital so much fun and i think that's really the storytelling uh you know between that recital so you know if you're close to a composer maybe you want to invite them i mean joanne barker is a composer so if you're anywhere close to joanne you might just want to have a joanne barker uh <laughs> recital and play all of your pieces that'd be fun joanne right well it's pretty cool when i started composing my own material for my studio and 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 then thought wow this was a recital it's all my pieces being played wow. that was pretty amazing yeah. and and i shared that with the parents too the, the music you're hearing today I composed and you know parents I think they enjoy hearing that it's not bragging it's it's sharing what you've accomplished and what you've done so don't okay. feel like you're being boastful when you tell parents that yeah I actually composed these pieces that's yeah. okay it's okay that's and it's fun. fun and I think you're really encouraging your students to become composers too so mm -hmm. all right number five tip number five for those of you taking notes I think this is a big one that I think it affects all of us, right? No matter whether you've used tip number one, two, three, or four, tip number five is not an option. And our final tip addresses the practical side, which is the venue and the pricing. 
So whether it's a traditional venue, you might have it in your church, local church or local high school or wherever there's, you know, hopefully an instrument or a stage, whether you're doing vocal, whether you're doing violin, um, you know, piano, whatever it might be, you might want to have a cozy home recital, right? Or you might want to have an innovative online recital. I mean, the choice of where you have your recital kind of sets the tone, right? And when it comes to pricing, there's a lot of options here. You can have your recital as a free event. You can have tickets to cover the costs of renting the venue. Or what I've done as well in the past is I've even had donations. And you can do donations that go to the church if that's where you're having the recital. You can do donations for a cause that's close to your heart. But whatever it is, you want to make sure that you are thinking about these elements prior to, you know, creating your program. Right, Joanne? Absolutely. And one other thing you can do, and if you're interested in learning more about it, I'll tell you where to get the information on this. Uh, I've, about 20 years ago, I started including the recital as a lesson. I charge an annual tuition. And if you haven't considered annual tuition, you can learn more about it in the combo, combo music lesson system. It's available, of course, it's available on the Ultimate Music Theory website. The benefit to that is you're not collecting money at the door. You're not issuing tickets. So you count it as a recital, at, yeah. uh, sorry, as a lesson, you know, just one more lesson fee. I make it equal to a half hour private lesson. And if you have multiple families, uh, children in one family, that's where I give the family discount. They only pay once per family to come to the recital, but then you don't have to worry about it. I've heard some sad stories from teachers who've said, you know, I put out the notice for the recital and out of 30 kids, 10 said they weren't going to come. And then two days before 10 more said they weren't going to come because they didn't want to have to pay at the door. So to, to circumvent that for your, your next lessons year's fees, like in September, consider that annual tuition uh, model yes. and including the recital in the fees it's kind of a no brainer then they can bring 25 people with them if they want to the recital, there's no additional charge. So it's a really good idea. And the other thing too, to remember with recitals there, we have this wonderful thing we're using right now called technology. Yeah. Live streaming your recital can bring in an audience from around the globe. If grandma and grandpa, and this happened last year, uh, actually one, one family, mom and dad were down South, like in the Caribbean. And so there was my laptop sitting on the communion table in the church and their two kids played for them while they were having their nice beverage by the uh, swim up bar in the pool. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what we can do because we all don't live around the corner from aunts and uncles and grandparents. Yeah. So to have that opportunity to be able to share that with the wider audience, it's it's fantastic. And I, I am a big fan of a reception after recitals. Um, I think it's really great for children to hear from other people. You did a really good job instead of in the grocery store two weeks later, somebody says to your mother, she, your daughter played really good at that recital. Yeah. I think it's important for kids to do it. Remember, yes. you want to keep it peanut free and all that good stuff. And <laughs> ways to do that. And we can talk more about that too within the membership. But it's it's really good to have a bit of a wind down for, mm -hmm. for students. I served ice cream bars last year. They're a massive hit. So yeah. keep it simple. But it's really nice just to provide that kind of, debriefing after recital because your kids energies are all up here and we need to help bring them back to the planet and it's great about it to, to be community and just to all be celebrating together it's just so so wonderful yeah i love everything that you said joanne because uh, first um i like what you said about recognizing the students yeah. and they need to hear from other people other than their grandma and grandpa or their their mom and dad so that's one big thing is to acknowledge you know other performers after the recital uh, the other thing too is that it is great to do a live stream or even if you're not doing a live stream just record it mm -hmm. you know one of the uh, videos we have up on our ultimate music theory youtube channel is one of my recitals which is called uh the jingle bell cup song mm -hmm. Now, I put that up there for grandparents and so on to see how we did the Jingle Bell Cup song. We rehearsed a lot. And that video has now got thousands of views on it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I, who knew that so many teachers would check it out and say, how did Glory do the Jingle Bell Cup song? So your recital, you know, obviously you have to have permission to be recording it and put it in, putting it up on a YouTube channel. However, not only did my students have an opportunity to share that with, you know, family and friends, but other teachers 
can also see, oh, that's cool. I wish that I would have videotaped the recital that I did with Peculiar Pets because it would give other people an idea too. So remember, we want to share ideas together and that's what it's all about. So as we wrap up for today's show, remember that every recital is a storybook of musical journeys waiting to be told. And these five tips are your chapters for successful, engaging, and unforgettable recital experiences. And if you're craving innovative ideas and you're eager to expand your teaching horizons, um, and you're looking to connect with like-minded educators, we invite you to join us at the Ultimate Music Teachers membership and our community at teachumt.com, where you can learn more about the Ultimate Music Teachers membership. That's right. You're going to find a treasure trove of resources, teaching ideas, games. I love creating games. Yes. And we have our weekly coaching calls actually in 10 minutes from now. So you can really, really thrive in your teaching business. It's about support. It's about encouragement. It's not a competitive community at all. It's it's yeah. you have to come and experience it. To be <laughs> Join us at teachumt.com. Remember, until next time, remember to celebrate the fact that you're helping to develop the next generation of musical minds so they can make a difference in the world. Absolutely. So thanks for joining us at the Ultimate Music Teachers Live Show. Uh, Joanne and I bid you a wonderful and musical day. Um, music's not just a melody, it's a movement. So till next time, teach with passion. Bye now. Bye-bye.